quite an introduction than a slideshow simultaneously. So this is like patting your head and rubbing your stomach. So please bear with me. Uh, Robert Berlin graduated from New York City's Cooper Union and attended Yale where he earned an undergraduate and graduate degree. He and his wife sailed on the USS America oh, wrong name. On the SS America for England in 1960, thereby missing the reception and positive reviews for his first solo exhibition at the Stable Gallery in New York City. Bob enrolled in London's Slave School of Art and made several trips to the continent. A visit to Spain brought him into contact with the work of El Greco and Zoran, with whom he was much, by whom he was much affected. While in London, he applied for and was accepted in, into a, th a three-year residency at the American uh, Academy in Rome. There he painted urban figurative compositions and also images that explored the more distant aspects of his psyche, believing that his sleeping dream state was more vivid and pervasive than his waking life. Berlin returned to America in 1964 and taught at Queens College and resumed showing at, at the Stable Gallery where he had where his first show was very well received. Over his career he has had numerous one-person ex exhibitions and has been represented by several galleries, including a period in the 1980s when both he and Jerome were represented at the Sherry French Gallery. His work is in many public institutions, too many to name. In fact, each artist has a complete exhibition history and permanent collections listing in the exhibition catalog. So, a little plug for the catalog. Uh, I suggest picking up a copy of the catalog at the galleries. Tim Lorley was born in Hendersonville, North Carolina in 1958. As the son of medical missionaries, his father was a hospital administrator. He spent most of his youth in South Korea. He attended Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, receiving a BFA in 1981. That year, he married Sherry Rubing, and the couple returned to South Korea, where he came into contact with Lin Jung painters, then a recently formed group of artists who were deeply critical of the government. They identified themselves with the dispossessed and painted uh, political and social injustices from their point of view. After time in South Korea, Lowley and his wife spent six additional weeks exploring Europe, a time that he, he credits as his single most important experience as a painter. Ultimately, it was the birth of Lowley's daughter, Tema, in 1985, that was the most critical uh, uh, element in his uh, uh, artistic development. Immediately after her birth, she had ongoing seizures that left her profoundly and permanently disabled. Turning his artistic subject towards his daughter allowed Lowley to make what for him were truly representational paintings. Images that gave a presence to something that, that for someone uh, otherwise wouldn't be seen. Since 1995, Tim has been affiliated with North Park University in Chicago as gallery director, professor, and artist in residence. Tim is also a musician, part of a band called Tim Lowley and Baby Mountain. Their last album, Chasing Brother Angel, was released in 2004. Prove it. Uh, there it is. No joke. Right? Go for it. You know. So I was kidding, didn't you? Uh, and I just didn't show any of the slides, did I? Like I said, patting the head first, rubbing the stomach. Uh, I will do better with Julian. Julian Peston Craig, founder of Artistic Inspiration on a childhood visit to the, to the Mets Egyptian collections. Those sculptures spoke to her, making her feel very close to these objects that had been carved several millennia ago. Her education includes an undergraduate degree from the Rhode Island School of Design and a graduate degree from Cornell University. Initially an abstract painter, Jillian found her calling as a representational artist in her senior year of 50. She then taught herself observational drawing and painting using groups of small objects arranged in still life composition. That was good, I, I didn't know. Uh, a 
eventually landscapes entered her, her repertoire and included scenes of the area around Ithaca and later the beaches along the west coast near, San, near Santa Cruz. Bill Murphy grew up on Staten Island in New York. His interest in art began with the drawings, with drawings by Jack Kirby and Steve uh, Ditko from Marvel Comics. A little later, in the 1970s, rock and, rock and roll concert closer excited him in the same way. Murphy eventually attended Brooklyn College, the School of Visual Arts, where he earned a BFA, the Art Student League, and Vermont College, where he earned his MFA. Artists who have influenced Murphy include John Rowell, whose habit in the 1930s and 40s of going around New York Harbor looking for subjects Murphy found particularly uh, affecting. Another influence were the intaglios of James and Neil Whistler, especially the early etchings of France and alone. Murphy has focused on making watercolors, drawings, and prints of Staten Island and New York Harbor. Additionally, he, he has examined himself in a series of drawings, some of which place him in his studio in intriguing poses. Joel Sheasley. Man. Joel Sheasley attended Syracuse University as a transfer student beginning in 1970 and graduated with a BFA in painting and drawing in 1972. He never had a class with Jerome, but was a student representative in the painting department faculty meetings and got to know Jerome there. He continued his education at the University of Denver, where he had graduate thesis on abstraction, helped him earn an MFA. He continued to paint abstractly for several years, but eventually found the style unable to meet his aesthetic interests. He turned to figuration and incorporated it into his ambiguous uh, suburban surroundings that were in fact his Wheaton, Illinois neighborhood. His style has evolved to a point where a recent series of puzzle paintings blend abstractions interest, I should show you some pictures, uh, abstractions interest in planar flatness with scenes of his Rutted driveway after a rainstorm. So, the model didn't work out. <laughs> and lastly, Jerome Wigan. Fuck it, no. Yeah, you should just close the book. Just leave it at that. I'll, I'll, I'll say something. I'll do it. Boy, 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 Jerome Lincoln grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and at a young age exhibited great artistic talent. He enrolled at the High School of Music and Art in New York City where when he was 14 and spent his summers at the Scott Lincoln School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine. In 1957, Lincoln enrolled at the Cooper Union School of Art from which he graduated in 1960. On a Bueller's or Prize Fellowship, he studied at the Berlin Academy in Germany in 1961. Wigan received his MFA in painting from the University of Pennsylvania in 1970. Because he grew up and attended school in New York at the height of the abstract expressionist movement, Wigan's paintings could not escape its influence. However, his work is largely figural, full of energy and life. His paintings often portray subjects that, read, that resonate strongly with viewers. He has created large-scale series that deal with the Holocaust and 9 11, as well as individual paintings addressing the, the traumatic events of others. Along with his personal work, teaching has been a large part of Whitman's life. His first teaching position was at the College of Art at the Maryland Institute in Baltimore in 1961. He also taught at Manchester College of Art in England and the Moore College of Art in Philadelphia. In 1971, he joined the art faculty at Syracuse University, where he has taught for over 40 years. His most recent exhibition, Wigan and Wigan, opened February 20th at Photo Museo Curato uh, Caminos in Mexico City and is on view through May 15th of this year. Wigan and Wigan is a greatly expanded and completely re envisioned ex exhibition of the 2014 presentation. Twin Visions, Joel Peter Wicked and Jerome Wicked at that Rutherford Gallery, Fine Arts in Los Angeles. Uh, so with that, my work is done. So guys, <laughs> so, uh,
what I'd like to do now is just briefly explain how I envisioned this proceeding. Uh, we had a, a wonderful talk at dinner, and I, I, my vision is that this talk continues. Uh, I don't anticipate a structured event. I envision a, uh, a nice warm fire in the front, and these people sitting around uh, sharing ideas. And I, I hope that you can become a part of that conversation by asking questions or offering comments at any time. And just, you know, if you, if you would use your outside voices, that would be great. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, raise your hand and I'll come back and I'll share my little uh, lapel mic with you. So, uh, with that, I'd like to, I'd like to ask uh, Jerome, because I, I believe he, he'd like to you know, begin the proceeding with a, a comment. So. Yes. <clears throat> About two weeks ago at the Bird Library, I was in, oh, about two weeks ago, about three weeks ago, about two and a half weeks ago, at the Bird Library, I was looking for a random book that would just appear. And the book that appeared was The Diary and Letters of Katie Colvitz. And then reading it, uh, two nights, I hit upon an amazing page, which becomes my first question to this really good group of people here. And I'll read a part of her diary from 1916, February 21st. She says, it is true that my sculptural work is rejected by the public. Why? It is not at all popular. The average spectator does not understand it. Art for the average spectator need not be shallow. Of course, he has no objection to the trite, but it is also true that he would accept true art if it were simple enough. I thoroughly agree that there must be understanding between the artist and the people. In the best of ages of art, it has always been the case. Genius can probably run ahead and seek out new ways, but the good artists who follow the genius, and I count myself among these, have to restore the lost connection once more. A pure studio art is unfruitful and frail. For anything that does not form living roots, why should it exist at all? So my question to these five friends is, who is your audience? I'd rather not start on this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I just ask first that you all use the microphone when, when you choose to speak just so that the audience can hear you more, more clearly? I'd say one of my most uh, treasured fantasies uh, in life is that I'm pretty much like everybody else. And uh, consequently, perhaps I'm making a mistake when I'm imagining that work making in the, making art work that makes sense to me is going to make sense to other people. So I mean there is this kind of perhaps great mistake, maybe he's kind of alluding that, but you know, we assume that every, we're like everybody else, therefore they should actually get it. But um, I think mistake as it may be, that's probably where I Okay. Uh, okay. And being someone solely about the uh, generation, uh, I was uh, imbued with the sense that. First of all, you make artworks for other artists to see. You make them for yourself, initially. In a sense, does the world need other paintings? There's so many, right? Artists need other paintings. Artists need to, need to make them. Artists need to get responses, especially from other people who have a sense of visual qualities. 
And secondarily, with luck, there's, they may be have an appeal or interest in, in the larger world. Ideally, I'd like to think of painting as a social act. I can't really admit, or rather I can't really say that I think I paint worrying about that social act. I paint out of my own compulsions, my own desires, my own fetishes, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, I think what I've just said now, that's in a sense unfortunate, but it's been in the nature of our time. And I am a creature of my time, unfortunately. Well, I think for me, uh, the audience uh, is myself. And when I start, when I'm in the studio, and I start painting, uh, immediately there's a kind of dialogue between me and another part of myself. <laughs> there's the me that uh, is struggling to make the paint, and then there seems to be another presence there that I'm painting for. Um, another way to put it is, um, it's like a letter. You know, you, you don't write a letter to nobody. You're, you're writing to somebody. So the way of painting is really like that. Um, but at the same time, I certainly don't think of a group of people who are going to sit around <laughs> and enjoy it, you know, different about it. But after I realized, yes, that's, this is a very good thing. They're doing, they're doing something different. The, and the purpose of that art is really rebellion, and so more power to it. And it's clear to me that that's not my purpose. You see, so I, I realized that the problem is not that people are not appreciating it representational painting, but the, the problem is that people are not making this distinction between painting that, that has the objective of, of moving people or inspiring them, or the objective of uh, rebellion or dissolution or trauma. So it helped me a great deal to see that, that there was a difference. And it helps when you, when you are, it's like, you know, you look, you go to Vermeer, and you're really interested in being shocked, well, you're going to be disappointed, you know? Or if you go to uh, Jack Coons and you want to be moved, well, you're out of luck. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but if you know what, you, what you're interested in, you, you know, render on the Caesar and go swing to Jack Coons. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm thinking, Bill, of your comment about you know needing some kind of an audience, even if it be a small one. And I think the question comes out of the sense that the audience for the kind of thing that you're making is being produced and produced. And um, and then you know your comment, Robert, about that being shared even you know, more and more broadly. Uh, and so it it comes to the import of our first response, which it seemed like every one of us responded that we're working out of a response to ourselves, largely. But we're not going away. We're still there, you know, uh, to do that. And I, I suppose what I what I see actually is that in whatever kind of uh, strategy artists are adapting or adopting. Uh, for making art, there is in every single strategy the potential for something really wonderful to be done. It's a question of whether anyone is up to doing something wonderful in that discipline, you know? And I feel about representational painters, that there are plenty of representational painters, realists, who don't necessarily know what to do with, you know? And, and so, in, in our own sort of little quote unquote club, whatever you want to call it, um, we are as responsible to uh, to this task of, oh, as Robert said earlier, you know, trying to figure out how to do it. 
you, as long as you have that kind of obligation and you feel that pressure, I think whatever type of strategy you adapt for making art has potential. I think it has, and so I think the ta painting continues to have that uh, kind of uh, potential. So, um, as, we, as we said before, you know, I think, um, uh, so the question was for the girl, uh, how do you make a really make an art most modern? Um, I, don't, I don't think in those terms personally. I, I just, um, I, I've never been, you know, you try to uh, work into, I think, the, uh, what seems to be happening It seems like when I was a younger painter, artist, uh, I, I knew there was an old world that I really, um, a number of artists who I really admired and sort of uh, found myself knocking on the door and wanting to enter into this uh, perhaps imaginary room, but um, it's all gone now. Uh, I don't see it anymore. I don't know if it exists or not, but uh, I go to the I try to go to the galleries that I used to go to years ago, and most of them were gone, or the, uh, the work they're showing that doesn't, uh, I really can't relate to it. And uh, it seems like there's been this whole reshuffling of, of things. Um, I see these, some of these artists that work being sold on, on the internet for a fraction of what they're worth and uh, what they used to be sold for. Um, so there's this whole kind of deconstruction of, of this world that I was, that I grew up in the shadow of, that I admired and where they are. Um, I also like looking around, I don't see too many young people here. Um, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a big question, you know, like what, what's happening. I don't, I don't get the feeling that um, what I do, um, the kind of thing that I'm interested in, particular type of drawing, painting, etching. Uh, I, I don't see it as something that's in great demand or great interest for people now in their perhaps 20s and 30s. Uh, so it's, it's a big question. And I, I, don't, I don't have an answer to that. But that's, that's what I see. So. There's, there's some factors here that to me are have in the past been relatively unnoticed and invisible, but it have become in recent time very glaringly obvious that is power, power drives what people see in this culture. Larry Bogosian decides very much what gets seen. There's, there's a very increasingly small group of people in this country who are determining what art gets seen. Um, I think that's actually been the case for a long time. It's just been more invisible. Another thing that you were saying about is actually, at the same time, there is actually a renaissance, so to speak, of representational painting, but it's taking place sort of in a curious marginal ter territory. And uh, I don't really know how relevant it is. Uh, one thing that really concerns me is that that, I mean, I, I'm going to be critical here in a way that I probably not want to write to be, I'm going to be critical. That world, which I'll Located, say, around the New York Academy of Art in New York, doesn't seem to operate in terms of thinking of art, including painting, as being a conceptual practice. And I think it is. I think all art is a conceptual practice. And until that world starts to take that seriously, I'm not sure they will be taken seriously by those who decide what is serious art. Conversely, those who sort of operate in that world, who privilege conceptual approaches to art, uh, don't seem to accept the possibility that that which is of the body, that, that would, the human makes, is actually a valid thing to take seriously as a conceptual piece. Um, but anyway, I, I just ran into the time. Yeah. Um, I'd like to contribute something. Um, I think the word permission, uh, when I was a kid first going to Europe, um, I think I was strolling through galleries like the Pizzi 
for the galleries in Berlin or London, then I was looking for art that would give me permission to go to a certain level of ambition. <laughs> ambition. All right, so the reason they're so stunning is because someone took the gigantic risk. Now, I, I, I feel privileged to have been an abstract painter for about five years uh, because it was the kind of juice of being constructed and destroying it and building it up again. There's nothing precious about those times of pain and painting. Yeah, at Cooper Union, we used to buy a Menti paint. It was painted in a jar, the size of a peanut butter jar. You would open it up and just go for it. And um, I think, you know, I would, I would like paint and scrape it off and paint scrape it off. And there's a way of unearthing something, of digging with something. And I, I think the thing I see a lot of kids work today in art schools, when I go to different art schools as a visiting artist, is there's a great deal of fear. Like, you've got to make them kind of say, you know, why don't you just jump in the water and swim? Right? Take a chance. And so I think there's a great deal of um, uh, substance in the internet. Uh, in the last 40 years, people I've seen work with people I've never even known about because of the internet. There seems to be an underground, you know, we're, we're doing this work with a figure, we're doing some ambitious stuff with a figure, and it doesn't matter if we're not cheered, we're simply having to do the work. And I think that's the word have to do is very important. Um, as far as conceptualization goes, I was thinking when you were talking, uh, when as a child you were ill or sick or something, my mother would uh, come back from work and throw like three comic books on there. And it was like, wow, three comic books. And I would look at it, and I was always bored by the little balloon thing, the story. And I would, even then I would say, uh, let me take three pictures and make a better story. We should be three pictures of this whole open thing would make more sense without words. And I think the idea of um, taking a chance with not just a, a single image, but a, a three or four images, and then condense that into a history that you've been very familiar with. And I think the, the kind of pressure cooker of putting images down in a diptych or a triptych, to me is fascinating and very difficult. And I like it because I can't find it easily. I like it because I have to wrestle with it. I like it because it's what they call the shit on the shoe moment. I know it's so impossible, but I'm willing to kind of get that thing on my back to do it that way. So I think um, the idea of struggle and finding something, I think oil paint is such where you can scrape it down and build it up. And if you're really good at it, you don't see all the kind of um, times if you remove them, you just see that skin that says, this is what I wanted. You know, this is what I want to share. This is what is something that I didn't think I would get. And I think that's the adventure. Well, my dealer also has a great expression. He says, don't worry about what people think of your work. The white person will present themselves. And I think that's very true. Uh, I would lose somebody he says, you know, I've got to talk to you about this. So we have connections. So the bottom line for me is, you know, when I see students who are 27 or 32, um, most of my friends make their breakthrough in that point of time. Suddenly something clicked and they felt dedicated to their definition. I feel sorry for people who, in their 40s and 50s, still don't have a dedicated definition. I think a lot of art today is about this week's dedicated definition. And I think that that's terribly sad.
is having a connection to a sense of realism emerging out of a kind of what I would call critical realism or objective realism, a type of attitude toward realism that, as you were saying earlier, Jim, you know, makes things accessible, but also the important for me, and maybe the most important fact, is the way that it also alienates you because the documentarian, if you want to take it that far with representational art, is also an alien from the very thing that he's connecting to. And once you um, recognize that kind of relationship that you actually have with your subject matter, with even, and even with yourself, is that you're engaged in this approach and also alienation. I mean, that for me creates a hat that I can't stop you know, being attracted to in any case, but, and uh, I think you're absolutely right. It moves you immediately beyond what is required in the next five, how do you put it, five minutes, and the, the, the sort of au <coughs> courant concern to something that just doesn't stop. It's just there for you all the time. It's a very deep well you just keep returning to it over and over and over. How about um, any questions from the audience? I have a question. I got to stand up first. Yeah, Tom. Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> My wife is telling me to let the universe. Oh, no, God. <laughs> this is the only one. I, I just wanted to ask that. I, I thought that issue of accessibility, you know, that representational work has always seemed to be, you know, the sort of the people's art because they can relate to the world. And I think that it's so fascinating for me to go to the show and see the quality of work and the range of the work because I sort of saw everyone in the show as an abstractions. Because what I, you know, the history of painting since photography and lenses was to differentiate paint from cameras. And, and, and I felt a great uh, uh, privilege to be in the comfort of the work because I was able to listen to Now, if we can flip these terms around for, for the sake of our moment uh, of the moment, I recall a noted realist painter, uh, Bill Perlstein, when he would give talks uh, earlier in his career, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, insisting he was an abstract painter, and he was influenced by Franz Klein, right? And he was, he, he, was, he was accurate, it was true, but it was untrue, right? Uh, because obviously these were very specific renditions of uh, new models. Uh, was his painting realist? Of course, it's painting abstract. Of course, it's both. And we use the terms very loosely. Just as in the political realm, people talk about being conservatives or liberals. And what the hell that means <laughs> depends on the voice, uh, the mouth that's coming out of it at the time. Uh, are the terms completely useless? Maybe. They have some use, but we're using them in the, in our, in the show that we have now, right? Now, every artist, I think, probably hates being categorized one way or another. But at the same time, we know, you just, I know myself, that I'm doing it to other people all the time. <laughs> um, uh, there is that double face when we part work. Uh, it's horrible, abstract characteristics that have a particular kind of quality or lack of it, and its capacity to echo out into the world in terms of uh, associations we make with the colored mud that's been smeared on the canvas. Uh, we're always balancing between those two possibilities. Uh, 
right? Uh, as a informed viewer, observer, is who wish to one degree to the other, one degree to the other, aware of that balancing act between formal and uh, associational content, or content, as we call it now. Uh, I think that, that Jerome suggested that he has an idea about content and he wants to tell the story. Right? And, that's, and he does it with an amazing <coughs> skill and energy and, and, uh, and interest. Uh, for myself, I have a little different take on it. Uh, if an image, an idea, an impulse, if I can see pictorial one rather than one about me, I must say, uh, uh, comes to me, and I begin to work on a canvas. Uh, I like to keep the canvas open as long as possible to major changes. Changes, I'll move the figure from here to there, turn it from a man to a woman or a dog, uh, shift, the, shift the space back. Uh, but the painting in process is, is a kind of very elastic kind of being that is, can be molded and changed again and again. It's, it's not a very economical way to work. <laughs> um, and very often I wind up with an image which is so far from the original impulse. Um, partially because in the, in the time it takes to do a large painting, your own idea about what is happening, what the next step would do, uh, it changes and develops. Um, what the message is, or the content is of the painting, isn't really manifest until you reach a point where you feel you're having, you, you, you've achieved some kind of formal resolution. And in a sense, the content only emerges rather slowly, often after the painting is done. There are unconscious impulses that have been in, 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 in play, as well as conscious ones. And sometimes, I must confess, uh, someone comes from a painting of my own studio and tells me things about it, about its content, that I haven't really considered. And of course, that changes the painting. Every word that says about a painting changes the painting. There's an interplay between the object, the painting, and whatever cultural or intellectual uh, constructs are made of that. So it's plastic. That's it. And that's a different way, I think, of thinking about making painting than, uh, than, than, than yours. Well, Picasso's famous statement that painting is a matter of destructions. And you've got to be really open to being pushed around by the genesis of this thing, and finally it does go on scale, and then there it is. It looks very familiar, but we had to go through a kind of wrestling match with idea. Could you offer your question? So I um, find drawing very magical, that I just don't feel like I'm an abstract painter, but I'm also a teacher. So right now I'm teaching uh, portrait drawing and a creator. And I'm drawing a portrait, and I find it so difficult because I know I can do it, but I haven't done it in a long time. And I was wondering, for all of you, do you feel like your drawing skills are even better now, or do you feel like um, sometimes as you're getting older, you know, as you're getting older, do you feel like you're losing some of that 
that skill and it's frustrating or you feel like you're better and better at it? Um, you are all very proficient. rip up your drawing, don't be upset because once you've done a drawing, you can always do that drawing again. It's the drawing that you haven't done yet that you need to be thinking about. And I, I've always found that to be true. You know, it's um, maybe it'll change in another 10, 20 years, I don't know, but uh, I, I, I'm not aware of any erosion uh, personally. Uh, but but I think it's really true that in the larger, um, the deeper sense of making a picture, um, it does feel like once you've done it, you know, it's okay. It's okay to rip it up. I mean, if you wanted to, but you know, it's uh, it's hard. I'd like to ask about um, one of the great drawers. Is of course it's anger, anger. And uh, I've looked at so many anger, the real things in my hand, in the brain. and I've looked carefully to see if there's any erasures. Not in the book, not in the book. And I think during his heyday, when he was in his 20s to about 38, um, you could pay half as much for a drawing of someone with a man in it as an oil painting. Toward the end of his life, he did get a little shaky with them and so on. You know, but he left it so huge. And I think every time I look at an end drawing, the simplicity of it, the perfection of it, I, I come up with words in my head like, you bastard, <laughs> <laughs> rat thing. <coughs> How come I can't do that? And, um, at the same time, there is a kind of majesty in our history where there's so many different hands, like drawings or you know, the, the portrait. And, um, I'm amazed at how uh, everybody sees different, just like we have proverbial different fingerprints. Uh, but I think the thing about, you know, I'm not a swimmer, I'm afraid of water, but I've never been afraid of pencils or paint. You know. And I think it's just a matter of jump in and do it and find it, and the one who finds goes to the next to find. You know. But you have to be able to have the uh, first spot. The, the drive to say, you know, I'll fail, but I'll get it. I'll fail, I'll get it. But when I did those drawings, uh, in fact, Jack Levine years ago in the studio told me he used photographs. And I knew that was not right. He used a miracle of some sort. David Hockney is trying to find out, because he can't really draw that well, how the camera would sit there works on. The point is, if you have all behind next to you a man, who are you in the middle? You know, what I mean? it's it's a magical trick, but it is something magical. It's a great question, and I hope you go back to the abstract paintings. Uh, what's your use of the drawing? To now you see that for me, um, every time I start a new drawing, every time I start painting, I'm learning how to paint and how to draw this painting, this drawing. So I feel like I I don't. I don't draw anything like what Ang does. Ang, I think, is based on sort of like this structure building towards something. For me, it's always, I don't know what I'm doing. I come to this subject, I've never drawn this subject, what am I doing? And I don't know if that's really a very smart practice, especially when you're teaching high school students, but um, that to me is sort of, I don't know where I got that idea or when that was taught. Can I sort of reverse to a question right here? Um, I was taught by post, well, yeah, what do you call them? Post FX, people who were taught by the FX people. Abstract expressionism, in my view, was the most dominant movement of the 20th century in terms of how it was a singular movement where if you didn't do it at the time, you were dead as an artist. And I came along another you know, 15 years on the tail end of it, but I actually ultimately am very grateful that I was taught to paint by people who really loved abstraction, and so they got us into loving material and process before we really were put, putting that process in the service of making a representative painting. 
I have a sense that's true of at least the four of you. Is that true of you as well, though? And I, I, that's a, you know, you see us as realist painters or representational painters. The truth is we're coming from, I don't think we would be the painters we are have we not gone through that sort of like, oh, what thing? What are you doing there? You know? um, and I feel very fortunate. Uh, and it's, it, as a teacher, it's the dig to get students to believe that's true and possible. So like, what is that attraction? Why would I want to do that? Yes, I, I want to go back to something along the same lines that you mentioned about uh, realism being um, accessible. One of our ways into it is we can read the story. A representational painting has these two levels the level of the story, in which you can read. And you know, there are some people who only read paintings, they don't actually look at them, they don't, they're not oriented that way. Then there's some people who really hate the story, they're just looking for the blood and guts, you know, the, the feeling, the music, whatever. Uh, but there's more people who can understand the story. And to understand this other level. And I know all of us do this in a slightly different way. I do it in a rather eccentric way. I start with a picture of uh, usually a very, very conservative, ordinary situation, a bowl of flowers or a person sitting in a room. And I just sort of draw the story. And then I start putting color down. And when it becomes too uh, documentary, when there's too much information, and it's just a story, uh, and either put it directly into the garbage, or I, I mix up uh, a color, very, uh, a wash, like uh, pale green, so there's a lot of waxness. Uh, unless the observer feels that it's more than it is, then the painting isn't finished. It's the same thing that, that uh, Robert was saying. It's my way of saying that it has to be more than it is. You see, in other words, you, you see the bowl of flowers, but you know it's got a second life. Now, some people, some people need an initiation to understand that in painting. Everybody can understand the story, but that's what I think art education is about. Also, art historic uh, history is about is to introduce people to this other kind of healing. I think of it as. Because when you look at a really uh, painting that has this quality of transcendence, you're lifted out of yourself. You, you feel good. You feel really good. That's the best that I can say. But it's definitely something you have to sort of uh, learn how to, how, to, how to see, I think. Or maybe people are born with the capacity to, I, I have to be shown how valuable it is and what it looks like. One of the people who really showed it was Bonard, because, you know, in my opinion, he can't throw us right out of a big bag. I mean, he's not bad, but uh, I think the right home But when you look at those paintings, uh, a piece of a radiator, a pot with a broken whatever next to it, and you just rivet it, well, then you're looking at that second magic layer, you know, I want to continue that. The thing about Bernard is that he got stuck on a picture. He would simply travel to some local little town, get a hotel room, put the picture up there, and fight it out until he could leave the hotel. You know? And that's, that's where it's at. Um, when I was 21, I was living in Florence, so I, I had some Italian usage from home, but I asked a friend to write a letter to Giorgio Morandi, who was in Bologna. And uh, the letter said, would you please uh, allow me to visit you during the week of my 21st birthday? I didn't expect to get an answer. I got an answer. And a friend drove me to Bologna. And it was Wednesday in the um, uh, little home he lived in, the Via Fandaza. And I walked in there, some pretty well-known writers were coming back and forth and waiting their turn to see Giorgio. And my turn, and I walked in there and I sat down. And a man of 72 was looking at me at 21. And I said to myself, why is he wasting time with me? Uh, I haven't done anything. And yet he believed I was going to do something, something. But I looked at him and um, I said, 
So let me give you two of my drawings of the best things I've done since I've been here. And he said, let me give you two of mine. They <laughs> <laughs> went to the scavenger and he said, well, there any other studio? And part of me wanted to say, I'm coming back tomorrow. Yeah. But the thing is, is a privilege to be in front of people that are wiser and deeper than you think they'll ever reach, like Georgia. Um, I spent a lot of time in the company of people like that. And because I felt so privileged, I had to do something about them. finding something like where they went, finding some kind of journey that was deep and rewarding. And I think, again, that's why we have these people on this table, these five wonderful people, because they kept their promises, they didn't stop them, they continued testing themselves. And I think there's a kind of congratulatory moment of saying, okay, I've hit 60, I've hit 70, I've hit 80, and yet I know where I've been, I've made those textures, I've made that stuff. And I, I hope that um, everybody has the good fortune that we've had. Are there other questions? Yes? Sudden, 
I see to the viewfinder a heron moving across the viewfinder. And I realize, oh, that's up there. I'm down here, I'm between these two things. So there's this kind of sense of whatever I do with this has to include some sense of my own scale in it. So it got that big, which becomes a problem when you have to move it around. But I mean, that is kind of what it seems to have to be. You know, I, when I was teaching at Cornell uh, all those years, I noticed something very interesting um, about students when they get to having their own studio. That there's a, there are certain uh, stages or, uh, of evolution that people go uh, hit on their journey to sort of discover who they are as painters. One of them is finding what kind of mark they want to make. Is it a paint roller? Is it a tiny brush, you know? And once you get a feeling of what kind of mark, you, you, it's a really a big moment where you find this is my mark. But it has with it a kind of scale, although there are some artists like Tim who seem to have scales that go all, their scale is a lot of different scales. Other people settle into some, some scale or other. And I started because my, everybody at school wanted to paint like the pruning. So I've been painting with big canvases. I had a paint roller, not that my piece of brush, I had a paint roller. I can't believe it, but uh, anyway, everybody was trying to, I also smoked camels, get up filters. <laughs> See, he, that's what he smoked. Uh, but anyway, uh, eventually, you know, I realized I just want to paint this with a paint roller. Um, and when I started teaching, I asked the kids to buy a, a 16 by 18 stretchers, you know, which is a small size, so they would be overwhelmed by it. But of course, it was also something I felt with, uh, affinity to. And the kids at Cornell were so rich, you know, they leave all their sub materials behind every semester, so I just clean up. And I had a lifetime supply. But that's not the reason I paint that side. <laughs> but that's the way it turned out to be my scale. I didn't realize that. And I think once you find that, you recognize it, you think, yeah, now, now I can start to paint my world. Because I know at least the scale, you know? So. That's wonderful. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful, wonderful statement. Uh, and made me think about it. Uh, it wasn't until I started working large enough to work with my old armor uh, I heard about painting now, etching, etching is a private thing. But, uh, when I work with my Lord and make, make forms and figures that were near life size or nearly life size. And it made me begin to think about my body and the body being depicted and the psychological and sense, sense of physical distance between me and some other observer and the forms of the paintings. Uh, that there, that in, a, in, a, in a painting large enough, you have some forms that are life size. They have to be actually larger than life size to feel life size. All right. Uh, and those forms which are uh, closest in the picture plane have a volume and a weight. You're moving back into space. And that was an exciting thing for me. Not the flatness of painting, but the, the illusion, the fiction, the just the way the world within has depth. You know. To have depth. And the figures, as they move into distance, have different properties. 
they just as uh, what is it? Uh, e. M. Forster, the novelist, writes about uh, in his theory of the novel said that chief characters should have volume and weight. Characters which are secondary can be in relief. They don't have to be in the full round. And characters that are minor characters are basically silhouettes, right? And the change in one's response to physicality of bodies, not only human bodies, but the, uh, whatever else you can think of, but, uh, have different distances between the tactile, the sense of the visual, and what I call the insecure distance. That's a very exciting thing. And the mark, that mark, that I kind of going back to make a form. And an artist came in, a, 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 a very interesting artist, he's some sort of culture about full tech. He looked at many I was doing them, they were like six by six feet. And she, he said, make them bigger. And that was just for two reasons. Most of the reasons I've explained, but also because we thought they'd be more, they'd be more impression in my uh, ambitious forties. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he was right. You know, the pages were better when they got bigger, and they made more impressions. <laughs> Now I don't have the energy to do work on that skin, but uh, uh, it was an interesting insight at the time. Yes. Anybody, anybody, another question? Go somewhere else, but I have another question. Jerome gave a fantastic tour of the show. Yeah. And he loves all of your work. He was reverent. He, he, he loves your work. And in, in, the, in the talk, which was beautiful, it was a beautiful talk, he talked a lot about silence. He was very demanding, almost insisting that some paintings could only be done in silence. Silence? Silence. I thought that was very interesting because in my generation, abstract painting was associated with music. And there was a very strong affinity. And I'm always curious when I go to a visual art gallery yeah. that silence, silence is the mode of operation. Yes. It is, a, it is a, a sanctuary for contemplation without the distraction of sound. I'm curious how sound is represented in your work, in both in terms of when you work. Do you work with sound? Do you work with music? And second of all, do you express through scale and volume audio through visual information. Because scale and volume are auditory terms as well. Well, actually, you know, first of all, in, in the big multi-panel painting of the uh, walkway over the Long Island Expressway, I, I hope, and, and a couple of people have mentioned it, so, which pleased me immensely, saying they felt the sound of the expressway and the cars going underneath. Uh, and uh, that's a you know subjective kind of response. But that's but that it, it pleased me immensely. Otherwise, yeah, I, I always have the radio on. <laughs> and mostly talk radio actually. I, I during that talk I was looking at the Jillian's paintings. And they didn't mean, I think I said that, that years ago I visited a very, Aaron Schiller, I got the name now, he died about two months ago. Uh, Aaron Schiller had a beautiful studio uh, near the Museum of Natural History. You'd go there and this woman would take your coat and lead you to the door and then he'd take him in and you were like watching this whole guy or something. Like that. But Aaron said something interesting. He said, you know, I never paint portrait until it's about 2.30 in the afternoon. Because the light changes. The light is kind of velvety. And Leonardo said the same thing. 
And then when I looked at Jillian's paintings, I said, she's got to work in the afternoon. And you said, did you work in the afternoon? <laughs> 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 I mean, the, the thing about lighting, uh, with, with, I mean, Melania also, but the thing about silence is a great thing. Because I have models posing for me all the time, and we're talking, I have, you know, music going on, music jazz, um, and we're talking. But all the time, I'm actually kind of semi hearing and it's the silence in the picture that kind of forms that are putting itself together. That's the kind of silence for me. And that is unreproducible, because even though you're talking, something is emerging. And it's mysterious that way. And I think to be a painter of images is so beautiful because you know you you spot the need for somebody or something and you kind of live with it, live with it, and live with it. And I've had many friendships in the silence of knowing the figures I'm painting. Beauty seems to be uh, really uh, like an old-fashioned word now, and, and I wonder what the uh, in this modern time when we're surrounded by so much imagery uh, is beauty even relevant, and or do you strive for it in any way? <laughs> Excuse me, just so I, so I understood, you're you're you were asking is. Beauty a relevant category? Is, is it, yeah, is it something to be the, the ultimate thing to strive for in a picture? Uh, or are there so many other emotions that are not necessarily beautiful emotions that you're trying to uh, bring out? Uh, okay. I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, I, I appreciate that question. It's a, it's a, it is a meaningful question. Um, I mean, it's a cliche that, in a lot of ways, you know, beauty, the past, and it, it seems that the 20th century sort of the Dada, it wanted to throw beauty, throw that all out, maybe because of the industrial ugliness that uh, began in the 20th century. But are, are we trying to uh, go after a, a sense of beauty as a, as a headline? I would, I would think that if you in this exhibition that there are some works which you would want to ascribe to the term work had beauty as a concern. Uh, and uh, other works in which it is a uh, well, beauty might be a consequence of other other other, for other issues dealt with or other problems so you know, it's not direct that beauty is a direct concern I would say for my own work it, it's not uh, I'm aiming at expressing certain kind of psychological or, or physical states in, in the work uh, and if, it's ex if they're expressed forcefully enough and in, with some sense of authenticity, maybe you'd say that's beautiful. But it's not inherent in the immediate response to the work. I do think that with some of the other artists here, and I think most directly with, with Jillian, there is a genuine authentic authenticity in, in, in intentionality to the way she paints and the sensitivity with which she has material <coughs> immediately feel beautiful. I have the other gentleman that I have made that up for grants. I'll say one thing. The little head of Tema, the one facing in the darkness, I think, I mean, that's why I think I felt my knees 
uh, we're so privileged and we're so possible that you could have painted that. Because of the tenderness, especially on the acrylic. I think the acrylic is so difficult to match to all of our tone. But I thought that picture was just a grabber. You know, I just felt that it was the moment, the one with the head, um, the moment was so precious that um, I had to kind of forcefully move my feet to get to the next one. Can I speak to this? You know, I think uh, beauty is uh, it's not uh, in the world. Uh, it's, it's, in, it's something that's not in the world, like truth or love. And our efforts in the world can uh, reach towards it one way or another. But um, it's not something tangible. It's an ideal. We never can reach it. Uh, but our effort to to do that makes our lives richer for the for the effort. You see, um, but I I think I don't know. I don't know if I consider my work doing all very flattered that other people do. I feel that my work is, tends to be um, idealized, and I actually don't like the quality. But it's I try to actually paint uh, two people fighting uh, with their teeth showing you know, like this. <laughs> But I couldn't do it. So I went back to painting roses and sunsets. <laughs> but this is not necessarily beautiful. It's, to me, work is beautiful. It's done with authenticity and spontaneity. That is, a real, uh, sincere um, effort to, to talk with, the, I would say, the higher part of ourselves. Uh, so that is, it doesn't have any particular form. Each person has their own sense about what their ideal is. Um, anyhow, it's hard to talk about because it's out of the world, in fact. You know, it's certainly out of vogue too. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, I really, I like. If I heard you right, Julian, saying there's beauty in the world, that there's beauty there, and. Uh, I think, you know, what I see as an artist is, um, or, or what I'm attempting to do as an artist is not to try to make something beautiful, but in the beauty that is there, you recognize that there are certain things that are exquisite, there are certain things that are graceful, there are certain things that have an elegance to them. And so, I don't so much think about it as a problem of trying to make my painting beautiful, as I think of trying to get at something that parallels that exquisite quality you know, that I see sometimes, or that elegance that seems to, is necessary if I'm going to have any kind of relationship with integrity with what I'm trying to represent. There has to be that element in figuring out what that is. I don't, I don't think that's the same thing as trying to strive for beauty, because I think when artists have strived for beauty, they've created theories and strategies and formulas which have then become problematic, uh, and which is you know, where I think the question is. I think of uh, two quotes <coughs> to that, uh, that question, and that is a uh, Henry Miller quote that the role of the artist is to inoculate the world with disillusion. And um, I don't know why I heard that, but I think that, you know, a disillusion can be beautiful too. Um, and then there's a quote, a uh, simple quote by Matisse that um, uh, besides everything else, besides all the theories and everything, the, the picture uh, has to be beautiful when you hang it on the wall. Um, I have, I have an affinity for both of those quotes. And I think the big, the really big question is, we use a word like beauty, but it doesn't mean the same thing to, to all of us. And I mean, there's people who really enjoy listening, I guess, to, to atonal music, but I have a lot of problems listening to that because I don't find it beautiful. So uh, it, it is such a, 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 a personal, Word it's so hard to talk about. It. Question? Yeah, I, I wonder about the um, beauty and love, which I, I think it's all there in the world. And I go back 
you know, you mentioned at the beginning of the moment, you mentioned about the conversation that artists sometimes want to have with somebody viewing their work. And I think one of the things that for me, if I look at a, a Rodin sculpture, you know, the, the, the kiss, or, or seeing, uh, a, uh, I just saw Jackson Pollock painting, which just touches me, it, it, it's powerful. I look at a Rodin sculpture and it, it made me cry. And so somehow the connection is, that you're making, you're helping me see something that I don't otherwise see. And I wonder if that's part of what your job is. It's a wonderful job. <laughs> Uh, I think he's saying the spontaneity or the looking at a Rodin or a Pollock does something so stirring that it's a precious moment. And that beauty, but, but that these emotions, you mentioned, I thought you said that beauty doesn't exist. But I, I think beauty does exist, and you're helping people see that, you know. I think there's maybe the beauty of the effort, too. I mean, the magnificent failure of trying to make something. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of beauty, too. Um, I think the other kind of beauty is the ambition of, you know, when you look at uh, Rodin's, some of his great large pieces, or the Gate of Hell, or something, um, you look at that kind of ambition, and it's beautiful because of the attempt to do the impossible. But I mean, beauty, aesthetically, the last time I felt something was beautiful was in a Fantown Tour still life in uh, a museum.